Welcome to the RFLMS Unlicensed Podcast. I'm Caleb, this is Tassos, and this week we're talking to Sakita Med from Cambium Networks. Awesome, man. I'm excited for this one. Let's do it. Let's do it. Sakid, man, it's great to have you here. We're super excited to talk to you on our podcast here, get a little bit of your insight into the industry, your particular products and everything, and the things that you guys at KMBM got popping right now, and just generally what's going on, man. So for the good people out here who maybe aren't really familiar with you, if you could give us a little bit of history about you know how you came up in KMBM, uh, your role there, and kind of your general responsibilities and the insight that you've got in the company and what they're doing. Sure, sure. Thanks, Caleb, and Tassos, both of you. So first and foremost, uh, thanks for having me on this podcast. Uh, I like the format and being able to kind of talk casually and all of that and, uh, you know, talk about industry and the trends we're seeing and, you know, have a, have a learning session both ways. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, my name is Saqid Ahmed. Um, to back on the background, a little bit about me, um, I was formerly uh, at uh, Motorola, as you guys all know, we came out of uh, Motorola Solutions as in Cambium Networks in 2011. Um, so I worked for many years, uh, 15, 16 years or so at Motorola, everything from <laughs> two-way paging to YMAX. Uh, I hope I don't look that wow. old, but yes, <laughs> two-way paging was a real thing back in the day. Uh, 2006, 2004, I think I moved over from some of our cellular infrastructure start over to the Canopy organization, which was back then in, uh, you know, Schaumburg, Illinois. Um, that's where I kind of got into the core part of Cambium, which was Canopy at the time. And we also had our Orthogon point-to-point uh, organization. Uh, fast forward, uh, you know, 2011, we became Cambium Networks. Fast forward some more, 2019, Cambium became public, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, along the way, I guess where I have played uh, the biggest role at Cambium, or for that matter, in terms of wireless in the industry, is um, we started the EPMP product line, naturally. Um, that was essentially our desire or our answer to building a what I would call an affordable line of product that uh, can cater to a mass market audience that, uh, you know, wisps around the world, wisps in North America that want to get started, you know, have really good performance, synchronization, and all of that. Um, so I would say a good chunk of my career at Cambium was spent in not just building that first GPS sync solution based on, you know, Wi-Fi chipsets, but taking it on beyond that first 11N to AC Wave 2, then multi-user MIMO, and now moving towards an AX-based solution. Um, that's kind of where I've been. Um, I would say along with the product side, um, I've spent quite a bit of time you know, making friends in the WISP industry. I, I spend time on social media and things like that. And I love hearing from customers. So, you know, my mantra more, more or less has been to listen to our customers, understand what the challenges are and try to incorporate that into our product designs and marketing and all of that, right? Um, obviously, along the way, we became uh, good friends with RF Elements and we did some joint products together, looking to do more in the near future and whatnot. But uh, that's kind of the summary, Caleb. Well, that's great. That's good information. So, you know, you've been in the industry uh, for a long time, obviously, and really tapped in. So, you know, what do you think the state of the industry is right now? I mean, it's always an industry that's had a lot of changes. You know, we're, we're a very fast paced industry. There's a lot going on. But the uh, last couple of years, especially, have been somewhat interesting. Yeah. <laughs> definitely yeah, not really... boring times. Right, so. right, 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 right. right. Definitely not boring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, you know, from the state of an industry perspective, you know, where do you see things now? Uh, where are they going? You know, what's 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 really exciting for you? You know, you guys are, with 11X and the 6 gig stuff, I know those are really big, and especially in your product category that you're working with with the EPMP. So, you know, where are we now? Where are we heading? Just yeah, some insight yeah. there would be great. So, I mean, I wouldn't even call it insight per se. I bet you guys have come to the same conclusion. But <laughs> let's face the fact here. The pandemic. Uh, has been the biggest eye-opener for a lot of people in this world in terms of the necessity of broadband, right? No yep. ifs and buts about it. So I think there's one way to describe it is like while the pandemic sucked and still does, um, it changed the way we at work. The way we live and we work has changed dramatically and our reliance on broadband has been never uh, stronger. So what that tells me is the industry that we're in is in the best place we could have been since the dawn of broadband wireless is, is the way I see it, right? 
Uh, whether it's kids, uh, you know, doing uh, e-learning from home and realizing you don't have good bandwidth, whether us trying to do this video conferencing call and worried whether we're on wireless or fiber, right? I mean, that's the most exciting thing about it. But, you know, along with that excitement, obviously there's, um, you know, the, the other plus side of this is now we are getting the attention of, you know, government bodies, right? There's funds becoming available to truly go and expand broadband in a meaningful manner. Now we all know this initiatives and these desires have been around for a long time and there's still lacking of a true understanding of how much broadband has truly penetrated the United States. Um, but hopefully, how hopefully out of all this combination of better maps, combination of local state initiatives, funds, and last but not least, the most important aspect of this, the WISP community that is out there who are actually the most connected to reality. If their voices are heard and plug and tie up all these angles, then we are sitting in potentially one of the most exciting periods. And that's from a manufacturer, that's from a consumer, that's from a friend of the WISP industry, et cetera, et cetera. I love that. I love seeing that. I mean, we don't, we, we see a lot because I'm on social media yeah, pretty much yeah. you know, the majority of the time, right? So I see a lot of the negative out there. And we, we had a previous podcast about, you know, the doom and gloom that everybody's talking about. I'm just like, dude, I was like, no. do you not see the potential that's out yeah. there? And, and like, uh, they're basically just paved a road for us. I mean, if you don't see it, so it's great to see another colleague in the industry see it as brightly and as, you know, inviting as as, as I do as well. And, and we definitely have to get that message out to, to more people because, it, you know, again, if, if we don't all see it, then we're not going to really have the, the intensified force to really take on this industry and take it to a whole new level. So it's awesome. Yeah. And I think, I think, you know, and, and, and it's easy to get caught up in the challenges, right? Hey, uh, you know, this is complicated. The FCC is doing this, that, but there's, probably greater good coming out of all of this than we realize, right? Um, I think I think some people might argue that, you know, hey, uh, wireless is reaching its limits and things like that, but the reality is it's far from over, right? Have we adjusted our deployment models? Absolutely, you guys are a prime example, right? Cell sites are getting yeah. smaller, you're using different kinds of antennas. Um, so you adjust, right? Um, is fiber a threat? No, fiber is a complementary solution. Do fiber where it makes sense? Do wireless where it makes sense, right? But at the end of the day, there's money and there's technology that support the broadband industry. And the best thing is there's consumers that are starting to understand, right, what broadband means to their everyday life. And I think as, a, as an industry, as a manufacturer, we got to get better at uh, acknowledging the obstacles, understanding how to work around them, and also build our strengths to, you know, going inside the home, ensuring better experience for the home Wi-Fi user, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I could go on forever, but you guys get the gist of it. And I think you're in agreement too. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, for sure. From a political perspective, in terms of, you know, the FCC, uh, in terms of funding, the state level, the municipal level, you know, we've been in a lot of meetings, a lot of conversations and how much the the fixed wireless broadband industry or the WIS broadband industry in general is so much in the forefront of the, a lot of these efforts that are coming through. So, right. you know, a lot of that's been a lot of great work from WISPA, definitely been a big, big factor in that. Uh, but a lot of it is, you know, the big manufacturer's perspective as well. So, you know, when you've got somebody your size, as a big publicly traded company, well-established, long history, saying these same things like this is important for the people to get service and this is how we're doing it, I think leads a lot of credence to it as well. Yes, yes. And we're absolutely behind it. And there's a lot of initiatives internally to the company. We're watching this space, the funding, and, and I think we would love to get even more involved to educate our WISP industry, bring them closer to organizations that help with policy making, help with the intricacies of grant funds and things like that, right? So that's that's definitely up our uh, wheelhouse and try to help the WISP industry in that too. Definitely. I think another thing that, uh, you know, really has opened up our eyes too, like I said, it's not just, you know, where the industry is going and a lot of, you know, manufacturers and, and uh, you know, service providers and, and other things within the industry are seeing the potential there, but it also opened up our eyes too to the pitfalls and the Achilles heel, like the supply chain issues that we had and, and is really changing. Uh, I know internally for RF Elements, we are doing some massive things internally to really try and counter that or stop it from happening again and, and gaining more control over that. Is that something that Cambium is looking at as well? Oh, absolutely, Tassos. You know, this is a, a very important topic, right? I mean, 
on one hand, we're talking about the excitement and the opportunities. On the other hand, you know, we're also facing one of the biggest challenges in, in our career, right? Pandemic, you know, supply chain, shipping costs, chip shortages, and all of that, right? Um, what I will say in a, in a nutshell on that front, just like you guys as a manufacturer, right? It's, uh, it's exercising new muscles within the company. I mean, that's what this is. And that goes all the way down to our WISP friends and customers, right? We're all exercising new muscles. And I would almost say this is a good forcing function to companies to look at designs, look at alternate supply, alternate parts, right? And incorporating all of that. And, and the key is to do that enough before it, uh, you know, it catches up with you. And it was a surprise to some extent, but I will, I'm happy to say that we at Cambium have been, you know, embrace the challenge and work towards it in a very, very aggressive manner. Um, and I think we are going to come around it as a, as a, as the world does, uh, and, and get past the shortages and we should be able to supply, uh, you know, some of this move towards the AX and all of that stuff is part of that uh, strategy as well. So we're just like you guys. Yeah. We're, we're on that problem aggressively. Yeah, there are definitely some aspects from a manufacturing perspective and just a pure product perspective where it's like, oh, pivot, pivot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Gotta, gotta you make some it. some shifts and jukes and jobs on things. That's but, right. you know, it does, like you said, it does strengthen the product offering and the supply chain in general as, as we learned, you know, we all learned to be more adaptive. You know, this sort of just-in-time application that's worked for so long, we've now right. realized some of the pitfalls of it and everything. So, I mean, there's that aspect. There's stocking where you do your manufacturing, like you said. So, yeah, there's going to be there's going to be a lot of economists making a lot of money writing a lot of books about this in the end. So yeah. that might be <laughs> the next side project, right? Yeah. Right. So from a technology perspective, you know, we're seeing a lot of really interesting things. Uh, and then, you know, like right now, your guy's big push. I mean, you've got several, you've got several product families. And while they are working to one, you know, main goal of being able to provide broadband solutions for the masses out there, you know, each family sort of focuses on maybe a different way of doing it. So I know with EPMP, you know, the big, the big excitement level was coming down the pipe is the AX platforms. You know, the, the, the platform that... The previous platforms are very well established, very mature. Everyone's ready for AX. So if you can kind of give us some of your insight, uh, the elevator speech perhaps, as to what AX is going to bring to the industry on this platform, uh, not only now and in the near term, but in the, in the future, you know, things about loading or uh, upgrade paths and stuff like that. Yeah, it's a great question, um, Caleb. So so let me, uh, let me talk a little bit about what I consider the problem statement, right? It's, it's one thing to keep jumping on the next technology, right? And say, oh, AX is here. We got to do another product. Well, <laughs> what does it really solve, right? What, what are the customers asking for? Um, the reality is, you know, you have, you have two big issues, in my opinion. We work in a license spectrum. So it's the wild, wild west, right? Well, whatever we say in terms of synchronization, we're playing with each other. The reality is interference is brutal out there. So you need products that can deal with interference. Now, obviously, there is no one magic button that anybody can push that just makes things work in interference, right? It's a combination of things. It's best practices, antennas, power limits, some noise cancellation. All these things come together. And then, then some luck, too, in my opinion, right? You get a nice clean channel and be able to work. Um, so that's one. Um, in the middle of all of that, let's face it, people are wanting higher throughput. Whether you actually need it or not, you know, we can argue about that all day long, but the reality is people I love want, that debate. Right? Yeah, I, I want my gig, right? I mean, what are you going to do? So you got to play that game if you're a wizard. So as a manufacturer, so that means we have to focus on, hey, what platform do we work on that brings higher throughput? How do we get to that higher throughput? And then what can we do to, you know, uh, help the systems work more efficiently? Spectral efficiency, interference mitigation, et cetera. And then last but not least, I think one of the things I'll touch on a little bit that I personally have been pushing within Cambium, and we're going to have a solution here very soon. Is you know, at the end of the day, the quality, right angle is like, okay, fine, we give you great throughput and all of that, but in your smart home with all the gaming devices and all the sensors or thermostats and all of that, what is the true experience of that internet feed that you have in your home? And then we start looking at the next generation platform. No secret, right? We have we we were riding the wave of a standards-based chipset. Um, why did we do that? It's pretty simple. Economies of scale, right? 
if you're on a uh, proprietary solution, you're building FPGAs or ASICs and things like that, the current chip shortage challenges, that's a challenge you'll have to live with as well. You got to get in line behind some large guys building commodity chipset. So in a way, I feel that we are at a, a good position because we are on a standard-based path. Then on that front, naturally, uh, 11AC brought some good stuff. Uh, Multi-user MIMO, which you guys know that from a Cambium perspective, it's an anchor that we believe in and we've been demonstrated with our awesome Medusa platform, right? Wi-Fi industry, more or less, has been evolving and making Wi-Fi standard a bit more appealing and applicable to an outdoor deployment environment, right? So AX starts to bring things that handle some of the things I talked about, higher throughput, better interference mitigation, and handling different types of uh, uh, application. So when we go towards AX, um, right off the bat, right, um, I'll kind of walk you through this a little bit, Caleb and Tassas, just to give you an idea. You've got, yeah, uh, yeah, you got the ability to do OFDMA or multi-user MIMO, right? Uh, in OFDMA, you're able to use, uh, you know, subcarriers, smaller chunks of radio resources to send small data. So if somebody needs a little bit of data for a WhatsApp call, you can use less radio resource to make it more efficient. Uh, same thing, those radio resources could be used for things like uplink TCP acts and things like that, where in the past you'd use up more chunks of bandwidth. So inherently there's some efficiency coming in because of the concept of OFDMA and radio resource units and being able to allocate smaller chunks. Um, then obviously you start seeing the higher modulations coming in. There was a point in time, I'd be like, what are you guys thinking? You're not going to get 1024 qualm. I mean, you know, <laughs> fun, that's not going to happen. And I've been proven wrong to some extent, but you could also argue I was saying that because I didn't have a higher modulation product, but now that I do, I can talk about it. <laughs> the reality is the radios have gotten better, right? These, these so C's, uh, built in radio has gotten really good. So you are able to see links holding 1024 qualm at a reasonable RSSI and a reasonable SNR. And then when we introduced 4096 qualm on our 6E platform, like the 6 to 7 gig, what you fundamentally see is, hey, look, I can actually do 256 qualm or in worse conditions than I did in the previous generation. So overall radio performance is getting better. You're holding higher modulations. You've got that OFDMA play. And fundamentally, there's a lot of overhead react, uh, reduction in AX and send more data and have better latency, higher packets per second so I can handle small packets. So all of this stuff kind of comes together and makes AX a very, very compelling solution. That's why I'm personally excited that we, that we move from 11AC wave two to AX five gig stuff with that eight by eight multi-user MIMO platform. We're bringing a wealth of you know uh, good stuff into the mix. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm I'm totally excited for all the things that you mentioned, and I'm really anxious to see how 4096 QAM plays out in the industry. Because yep. again, I think the industry is moving forward. It's been part of our message, making the cell uh, cell sites smaller and smaller radiuses, getting closer to the customer and stuff like that. And uh, you know, when we do some of our calculations, even even uh, 1024 QAM, it's like it's basically half the distance of your 256 installation previously and then 4096 will probably cut it in half again so uh, it'll be interesting to see how that works out and what yeah. kind of hardware on the cpe side it becomes available uh to to accomplish these higher modulation rates but the speeds are going to be fantastic but i should also clarify to you the 4096 qualm is on our 6e platform right so oh, okay we have yeah in ax we're going to have two different platforms an 8x8 5 gig mumimo and a 4x4 6 gig so on 6 gig, we're going to support 4096 QAM plus 160 meg channel. So now you can potentially get really high throughput. Catch being you've got some EIRP limits. So yeah, you're absolutely right. I don't expect you're going to go 4096 QAM all the way to two, three miles. The paradigm is going to change, but it's already started. We're already shrinking our cell sites, right? Um, and, and that's how we can get the throughput. I think economic wise, you're still better off in, in the trenching for fiber in a lot of these cases. So we'll, we'll see. We'll see. All right. Well, yeah, those are some really solid points. The the AX, the move to AX is going to be, you know, massive for the industry. So what's the the path for people that are listening to this are really interested and they're thinking, man, this is some cool stuff. I need to get on top of this. You know, when, when you're telling new customers that this is what's coming, this is how you should plan to deploy. You know, what are your key points that you're telling them in terms of cell sizes and AP loading? You know, what are some of your hot points there? 
let's let's walk through deployment scenarios, right? And kind of talk about the migration type situation. So um, if you're an existing customer of ours, right? Let's say you've, and, and let's categorize them a little bit, Caleb, right? You got existing and net new customers. If I'm talking about existing customers who've, who've been deploying EPMP, um, as you have seen, one of our most important positions have been the backwards compatibility, right? I.e. forwards compatibility for that matter. Hey, can you take uh, your radios and keep talking? Um, so that is con- gonna continue on the AX front. When you deploy an AX AP, the expectation is it will speak to a subscriber that you deployed from the previous generation. Uh, having said that, I'm going to clarify something, which is that on day one, later on this year, when you're going to start seeing our AX solutions, it is going to be a greenfield. AP will talk to an AXSM. Under the hood, we will have backwards compatibility, but we're not going to go commercial with that just yet. And this is to the, all the customers that went through the whole painful beta period of cooking backwards compatibility. It took a while. And what I'd hate to do is throw this solution of compatibility into existing networks and have people face issues. So we'd rather bake it, cook it with friendly customers, run its course and make it very solid. But initially it'd be sort of a uh, greenfield, AX to AX, right? I think, I think, you know, people will tell me, Saki, come on now, without backwards compatibility, I'm out of business. I'm like, okay, I get it. I'm sorry, but I'd rather cook it first. So, so Greenfield will go out. It, and it's a great approach. And I think, again, this is something that we see a lot. I mean, the industry and, and the customers out there really appreciate honesty, right? And uh, they they really they really appreciate, you know, some some sort of forethought on, you know, this is probably the best we're, we're doing, even though you're not happy with it, you know, there's a reason behind it, right? And uh, you guys being public about that information is just fantastic because we really don't see that from many of the other players out there, uh, to be quite honest. So you guys are, are well known Thanks, for Justin. it and uh, good on you for continuing to to you know uphold that uh, kind of principle for the company. I love it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, so we'll go out with Greenfield AX to AX. Um, you'll have an 8x8 AP. You'll have a 25 dBi dish product. You'll have a two by two AP, which is going to work with uh, RF elements, horn antennas, which are super popular. Um, and then on the six E side, which is obviously a hot topic, right? It's a separate skew, and some clarify that as well. There's obviously desires. Hey, why can't I have a full two gig wide product, right? That I can just throw in and have it talk to my five gig SMs, my six gig SM. Well, if I went down that path, my AP is going to cost me like four times that it does today. And I probably wouldn't be sitting here talking about product launches this year at all, because I would still be in development state. So again, <laughs> comment about honesty, we took the path of saying, you know what, it's going to be better time to market, better for the industry. Yes, it's a little painful. You can't have this one golden AP that does it all. Uh, but for 6 you're going to have to put up a different 6 AP as well as a, a subscriber module. Uh, but that will support all the way from 5.9 to like 7,100. So you've got a whole swath of spectrum um, available. Um, there are customers that are starting to do, uh, you know, special temporary authority licenses. Uh, we've got some 6C gear starting to get out there. We want field feedback and things like that. Obviously, things like AFC, the automatic frequency coordination stuff is um, got to get baked through the FCC. There's people that submitted their solutions. Uh, all that's going to take time. Uh, but we're marching forward from a product perspective. Um, Caleb, back to original. Yeah, so backwards compatibility will happen over time. Initially, will be Greenfield. My recommendation is, hey, if we're in the most opportunistic, exciting time of our industry, then you should have some plans for new towers, new expansion. Go yeah. deploy the AA stuff on those things, right? Or if you can afford it, rip and replace the problematic, heavily loaded towers, throw the new technology, reuse some of that stuff mix and match a little bit. Um, that's sort of the position I would I would present to you on that. Yeah, and, and, and it also makes sense because, I mean, no matter what, you know, every WISP is going to put up a new tower and it's going to be a greenfield install anyway, right? right. So, right. you know, there's, at least they have the security knowing that, yes, I can't upgrade my existing stuff yet, but hey, I can go into new service areas, offer these higher packages, and they could also, it gives them time to figure out in a new market how well does it work? What they really can do before they decide to take that step and start rolling up the the old stuff. So, I mean, I think it's a solid approach. Solid approach. But yeah, I mean, there's gonna be people that are 
trying to figure out what their new deployment mechanism too. Cause what worked when you're getting just kind of a janky 64 or 256 qualm network, you know, th those practices are not going to work anymore when you're trying to run 1024 or 4096. So, you know, you've got things like figuring out what your effective ranges are going to be. Uh, your antenna down tilts are going to start playing into a lot more factor than necessarily what they would trying to limit that cell size as we've talked about. Yep. Uh, new horn arrays, you know, you know, one, one common conversation we have where people are like, well, why do I want to use a smaller horn? with less gain and understanding the core concept of well, you don't always necessarily need all the gain you, you can see 10 miles it's great but a lot of times especially in these high density you know short range networks you, you're wanting to really pull that back so you're not pulling all that noise in so Some people forget gain works both ways right i mean you're, sure. you're, you're picking yeah. up interference too so exactly i mean that's something we talk about all the time yeah. So, and I think, I mean, realistically too, you know, I've, I've had this conversation about the split skew thing and we're like, well, what if I want to roll back to five gig? And I'm like, realistically, if you're not going to be able to find a clear sped of spectrum in six gig anywhere, like you're not realistically rolling back in the five cause it's just completely hammered. So no, I think that's good. And it's really exciting. Um, you know, everyone's going to start uh, picking up and run with this stuff pretty soon. So if, especially on six, if we can ever get the six E stuff done, the AFC and everything, so, yeah, yeah. you know, you know, this has been the next, the, the big new thing coming for uh, quite a little bit of time now. So, yeah. you know, where have you guys seen any updates from your side of the conversations you're seeing? You know, there's some, there's some EIRP rules. There's some weird things on the STAs where you're experimenting stuff now. You know, do they think we're going to get a little bit more, um, I guess, refinement in those rules and stuff like that here soon? Yeah, you know, to be honest with you, Caleb, I, I think the rules are in, in terms of the EIRP limits and all of that, the very low power, the standard power, um, we feel that that's pretty much defined. Um, the AFC submissions of the proposals on how to handle protect the incumbent microwave guys, that's also uh, relatively clear. And we've seen some, uh, the Wi-Fi Alliance and another group, the Broadband Forum, some of these guys are very active and we're on those uh, bodies as well. So watching things, it seems that things are moving along pretty well. Um, I'm going to kind of speculate a little bit. And my guess is that, you know, you've got multiple AFC systems. The FCC has to validate that stuff. Does this stuff really work? And give a certificate that says, yes, your solution is acceptable as a commercial deployment. And I think that's what's going to take a little bit of time. The good news is, is nothing, the, the AFC stuff in 6 gig is nearly not as complicated as CBRS. Um, so... Solution is simpler. You already know your locations. These are all static licensed microwave deployments. So you're just protecting against those or protecting those against the new deployments. Um, I think it's just a matter of time. I think FCC is working towards it. I've seen indication where some blocking issues have, remo have been removed, like from parties that are saying, hey, don't go forward with that. Uh, I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic. And I think there's just this overwhelming surge of demand and ask, right? The 6E ban has been promised and it's a getting exciting opportunity. Uh, I think that's going to help us get through this. If not later this year, early next year, I expect that we should be in good shape. Yeah, we're, we're all looking forward to this as everyone else is. So good deal. Good deal. Yeah, I just I just want to know. <laughs> You know, yeah. it's just it's just killing me. All these, you know, potentials, maybes, and what's happening, and you know, it's coming soon. It's not coming soon, and just it's just it's just killing me because again, as a manufacturer on our end, we're really we're we're kind of a step behind. The radio manufacturers are the, the really the first ones to get everything going, and then as an antenna manufacturer, we kind of have to see what you're doing in order to know what's the best thing. And and I think you know you know. Customers always want, like you said, you know, they, they, they want the golden egg. They want, you know, the widget that does everything. And I think sometimes they don't really understand what some of the design compromises are in order to give them that stuff. You know, for, for example, on the antenna side of things, yeah. making a very wide band antenna. I mean, yeah, it's simple if that's all we're doing. You know, if we don't care about the stability of gain, if we don't care about the, you know, the different polar plots for every polarity and all these other things. Yeah, we can do it it and I think it's important to kind of put that stuff out there. Same thing with radios, right? Yeah, sure, you can make a, a five to seven gig if you want, but I mean, it gets really expensive. It's really difficult. All the filters and amps, and they start getting bigger and heat yes. sinks and all yes, these yes, all yes. these different things that go into it that really they don't understand. And and I'm not saying the industry doesn't understand, but some people don't understand. It's really good to put that information out there and paint that picture for them so they, they have better clarity. And I think it helps us evolve because 
because and, and I've seen it already as we go from you know product generation to product generation you know the industry gets smarter and they learn from the old old stuff and they bring it over to their new stuff and therefore things start to move a lot faster because there's there's less tension that way so yeah it's I like I said I, I'm ready <laughs> I'm ready for it to come because I want to jump into it so it's uh, frustrating for me for all the things that we have to, to wait on in order yeah. for it to happen so um, you know chip ship uh, chip set shortage you know <laughs> I mean you know what's that look like you know from from your end on you know the the chips availability you know to even get this let's say it gets ratified tomorrow 60s ago you know I mean how, how does that look from the manufacturing side from radio platforms no so you know I, I, I kind of touched on that a little bit earlier is like is like the, the, the let's just say that uh, the indications of when the problem showed up, right? That's obviously not today. It's months, uh, years ago, almost, right? So any manufacturer that acknowledged the challenge and corrective actions are the ones that are going to hopefully come out on the other side. And I'm happy to say we're one of those companies. I mean, that's why we are talking about 6C and AX, because that's the next generation, more efficient chipsets that are being manufactured out there. So you'll see this massive industry push um, you've already seen the big enterprise guys, right, starting to talk about uh, 6Es type stuff or what AX based chipset. So I think we're on that same path, and and we should be able to leverage the new technologies to make those chipsets and get past the supply chain challenges. Um, obviously, right, it's not here today, meaning the products aren't there today. If you're a customer, you're going to go through summer months. You're going to have to deploy. You're going to have to make some decisions, right? You're going to have to go deploy some of the stuff that we're shipping today, like 3000 and this and that, and sort of, sort of, you know, spread yourself a little bit until the next stuff comes in. I mean, that's just a challenge that we navigate on the manufacturing side and, and our customers, the WISPs have to navigate. And, you know, same thing for you, right? Tasso, you guys, Caleb, you guys make a new antenna. You got the next gener earlier generation. This one's delayed. What do you do, right? You got to balance all of that. So that's just yeah. part of the reality. Yeah, that, that combination of filling your current needs and also trying to plan forward. You know, a lot of people just don't see that. We just think, just, oh, we're just going to magic antenna factory and a magic chipset <laughs> right. factory where we hit a big button and now it, it sort of splits out. Well so, yeah. I typically know. find that that's, that's the newer WISPs that haven't gone through it. Obviously, the older veteran WISPs have been through it and they, they have a better understanding of, yeah, well, you know, do you want to provide service today to this, you know, potential customer? If the answer is yes, you deploy what you have, right? You know, and and when the new stuff comes out, then you're you're quick to to jump on it. So, right, yeah, we've had so many sort of in, in shifts in our industry as well. So those of us that have been doing 15, 20 years, you know, we saw it from, you know, B pre B to G to N to AC yeah, now to AX right. and the FPGA systems. You know, back when a when a when a really hardcore high end system was like four megs, it's like oh, this is amazing. So. <laughs> You know, some of us, that, the ones that with experience have, have seen it and know what it takes to roll into the new, but I think it's important to the, the newer whiffs out there to say, look, you know, you're just not going to get an off the shelf solution uh, that's new to, to just go balls out, you know, immediately. This is just not how technology growth moves. Right. And, you right. know, you might hear a lot of promises and fancy verbiage and uh, a physics breaking and stuff like that out there from, you know, some random source, but in the real world, it's not really how things work. So, yeah. You can build that Cadillac all day long, right? I mean, as we were talking about a wideband radio and the amount of stuff that goes into it, but economics come into play. No matter how much we say, hey, it doesn't really matter how much an AP costs, it does matter at the end of the day, right? You, you still have to run a business. So, yeah, Caleb, you're, you know, there's there's lots of claims that are being made and, you know, it will always happen. We've seen it over the years, right? Cycles of, hey, we can do XYZ. But the real world deployment model, the applicability of these unique cases and the economics of it is what drives the adoption at the end of the day. Uh, we've seen things come and go and there's people that are still standing with core technology that works, right? So um, definitely, uh, it's always, always interesting. It, it keeps things exciting, but we always fall back to what works and what makes sense for the industry solutions wise. Yeah, I like the, let's just wideband everything. I mean, how hard could it be? Like, do you, do you have any idea what a 2.5 gig wide uh, LA or LNA and PA is going to cost? And right, yeah. 160 yeah. megahertz channels for everybody. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <Woo>. <laughs> 
Good times. Yeah. So, you know, we see a lot of growth, obviously, uh, you know, in the, the U.S. is primarily where, you know, where we work and we're focused. But, I mean, you know, we're both global companies as well. Oh, yeah. um, and we're seeing, I mean, we're seeing a lot of growth in a lot of regions and wanted to see, you know, and a lot of times our growths are tied, you know, where you guys are growing, we're growing as well because so many of our solutions work together hand in hand. So, you know, what are some more interesting regions that you're seeing or, or globally things like we're doing? We're doing a ton of stuff in Africa. Um, we're seeing some of the, the mainline operators really pick up and run with things. So that's exciting. Uh, Latin America is big, um, getting deep in the APAC, starting with that rollout. So, you know, globally, are you seeing, you know, similar to the growth or are those shifts different or kind of what's your perspective on the, the wider global market for anyone out there listening? Right, 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 right. So, um, so globally, first and foremost, your statement that where you guys see growth is where we see growth and vice versa is very, very true. Um, so from a, so let's, let's kind of talk about the regions and, and growth, and then I'll talk a little bit more specifically, uh, how that growth is playing out. Uh, so at a high level, uh, Africa, definitely an exciting part. Uh, we're seeing more wisps, uh, you know, coming over to Cambium in places like South Africa, Nigeria, and other places. Um, we're also seeing an interesting trend where, you know, some of the, like you said, the, the higher tier operators, right? In some cases, larger players that are not traditional WISP are saying, hey, um, I want to do enterprise broadband and I need something economical. Uh, I've never tried, you know, five gig unlicensed, but hey, it looks like I can give 10 meg bandwidth packages to this bank, right? So they're starting to come over. And that's where Cambium obviously has a very strong sales team and whatnot and partners in, in distribution that we can uh, uh, engage with those types of accounts. So there's like a there's like an adoption uh, from players that we would have we wouldn't typically see in fixed wireless. That's the a positive side in the rest of the world. Uh, while at the same time, there were wisps that have through the pandemic seeing the same challenges. Like what I, I've, I'm exhausted what I've done with what I have. I got to look at something else, right? So they're coming and talking to Cambium. So that's what we see. Um, so Africa is a big one. India is a place where we're uh, seeing some good traction in APAC region. Um, Indonesia continues to be a strong uh, opportunity for us where we are, are playing a big role. Um, Eastern Europe, right? I mean, RF Elements, home turf around that whole area. There's still lots of uh, wisps that are trying us and, and kind of seeing what capabilities we bring to the table compared to what they're used to. So that's also a hotbed. Um, Kala is also certainly an interesting place, although Kala, you know, some cases I'm seeing government type initiatives that are driving our growth. Um, the traditional WISP per se in some parts of Kala is actually not as hot anymore, right? Because we do see aerial fiber being an economic option out of Kala in some, car, some cases, and that puts some pressure on us. But there's more complementary projects that are helping us get there. So uh, I'm excited at what I see in the rest of the world. And I think I strongly believe that the, the financial incentives put forward by the U.S. government, whether it's the infrastructure bill, the art off and all of that, the uh, similar packages are just a matter of time away. I think we're already hearing from European Union about 300 megabits per second requirement for EU funding. And you're going to start seeing more of that globally because everybody realizes that broadband is the same necessity as electricity and running water, right? In, in every corner of the earth. And I think that's why this excitement is not just a North America thing for me. I think it's a global, global excitement. So we'll see a lot more in the rest of the world, I'm sure. For sure, for sure. And I think uh, the technology has um, matured enough and is reliable enough where a lot of these sort of, you know, even the the level two, level three tier operators that may have tried it five or 10 years ago with no experience, no knowledge right. base or anything are now reapproaching and saying, you know, we know this works. We can see how much money the government's putting into. These are valid solutions. Maybe we just, you know, let's try this again, but do a little more legwork and homework into it. And I think this is where we're starting to see a lot of this take off. Um, and you guys are especially like entrenched in a lot of industrial areas and stuff with other platforms uh, in these regions where the broadband side hadn't hit quite as much. And I think that pulls that up in that market because yeah. like, you know, we've been here Absolutely. working these solutions for years and years. So, right. Absolutely. 
No, it's good things, you know, global global supply chain. Add some global adventures, but, you know. We're yeah, seeing... that's true. That's true. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. exactly. So, yeah, doing business in, in certain parts, you know, a little different than what everyone's Makes used to. Interesting. Yes, yes. Keeps it interesting. So, well, cool. So, the other thing I wanted to talk about um, is tool set. So, you know, one of the things that Cambium has done really well is not just focusing on a radio or a particular solution or even a branch. You guys got a lot of different tool sets, whether it's radio perspective, you know, you've got Teragraph, you've got 5 gig, 6 gig, you've got LCE solutions, you've got CBRS and a lot of things. And, you know, I think a lot of folks are familiar with that, but I kind of want to talk about maybe some of the other tool sets. Uh, that we think are really interesting, or I think is really interesting, but maybe doesn't get as much conversation. Conversation. So things like uh, C and Heat, yeah. like C and Heat is a, a a solution to like answer the question of what is my coverage. What is my coverage? <laughs> like, what can I actually do? I think it's going to be a lot more important as we start building more and more of these smaller microcells and, and focusing on density pockets and stuff instead of going, well, you know, my, my average radius for a site was five miles, seven miles, eight miles in these rural areas. Now we're talking to cutting them down really small to maintain these higher order modulation rates. There's a lot more planning in advance that needs to happen to go, no go many sites and mini pops. So um, I just thought I like to bring this up because we get these mapping questions and stuff all the time. And yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, Taylor, I'm glad. I mean, this is a, it's a brilliant question because it's a topic that is, it doesn't, and it's not just about, it's not about Cambium and our offer, right? It's about, it's about manufacturers thinking beyond the radio, thinking beyond the speeds yep. and the feet, and the wireless WISP thinking beyond the speeds and the feet, right? It's, it's kind of, I touched on a little bit, right? Uh, Tasso is maybe a question that you asked about quality of experience. And I'll come on that, I'll touch on that in a minute. But it, it, I am amazed by the power of C and Heat. And I say this in a proud way that, look, the most challenging thing is to send that installer and have them muck around for four hours, pointing, listening, and doing all of that. If you can cut that down, if you can get there and know that you can do this installation, be successful in the exact way, I mean, that has to be super valuable, right? And we just, you know, we haven't talked about it enough probably and our friends don't understand it well enough, but CN Heat is telling from that perspective, right? So whether it's CN Heat, whether it's Link Planner, which has been around for a while, which is getting integrated and going to have a roadmap of its own. I think CN Maestro is growing every day and we're starting to think more in terms of not just, you know, dumping stats to you, but actually telling a story, right? Preemptively telling you, hey, there's a problem about to happen. Here are your recommendations of what you can do about it. You know, I think about this as Cambium as a company needs to think about automation, automation for your network, uh, allowing your operators to sleep better at night because the network should learn and take care of things sort of on its own. I mean, yes, it's a very grand and, and ambitious statement, <laughs> but that's but it's possible. It's, it's possible, possible. Yeah. possible. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's why I'm, I'm you know, I'm gonna. This is this is truly a plug. So, okay, go for <laughs> it. It's okay. But we are launching this quality of experience solution, right? And like you know, we got some great companies out there, and Prasim, I say, and all of these. But Cambium is going to come up with a QE solution. March fifteenth is going to be a public launch, but it's unique. Unique in that we're going to be the one company that can do things like TCP optimization, traffic shaping, application shaping, rate limiting, all of that stuff. But so are the same company that has access to our access points or schedulers and statistics and things like that. Marry those two up. Now I can have a dynamic relationship between my access points and my optimizer or my QE solution. All of a sudden, AP is congested. I can send information back to that. Says, hey, I'm going to enforce some automatic shaping rules, bring the congestion of the AP or the frame utilization done, right? So we're starting to say, Let's not just worry about the access point and the speeds and feet. Is there an intelligence that I can, because you don't want to push so much to an embedded wireless device that it starts falling apart because it's got to worry about so many things. Do your job, pass the bits and bytes. But if there's intelligence I can learn from you and apply, that QE solution becomes truly, truly very, very interesting. So there will be a lot more on that. And maybe we can do another uh, one of these podcasts, just talk about how to improve experience, all the different elements of it. But Caleb, to your question, the tool sets. This becomes another tool in the arsenal that we offer to slowly bring 
the conversation beyond just, hey, throw another radio, throw another uh, package on there. But how do you ensure that every application inside the home is working seamlessly, using the right amount of bandwidth, focusing on latency when it matters, focusing on jitter when it matters, et cetera, et cetera. That's fantastic. It's great. I mean, I think there's a reason why, you know, our companies just work well together, you know, Cambium and RF Elements, because we share, I think, a lot of the same kind of values and, and, and foresight out Absolutely. there. I mean, it's, it's, it's great to see you going, you know, beyond the radio. Um, I mean, again, there's, you know, there's there's a lot of, you know, I call them imitators out there versus the innovators out there. And there's there are a lot of, you know, industry firsts, I believe, in this space that Cambium brought to the table, right? I mean, you know, GPS Inc., you guys pioneer that stuff, you know, um, you know, sea and heat, right? I mean, I think, tell me if I'm wrong, but you guys were the, the first ones to right. really take that LiDAR data right. yeah, exactly. and, and bring it down into it, right? So, so again, you know, there are a lot of, <clears throat> again, uh, other people in this space that kind of have things, but they don't explain it well. They don't bring it together. They don't marry those products together and and teach you know the user base how to use it properly and and, and share their points of view on, on on things like that. So it's great again to to see Cambium really you know pushing forward with that kind of vision beyond the radio. Um, and it's just great to see, man. Thank you. Yeah, we want to keep doing that, and with you guys' support and collaboration, I think I think I think our goal is simple, right? We 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 just want this industry to succeed. We want to be leaders in the way that we can, you know, chart the courses and and help people do what they need, what they do. Our West provide broadband connectivity. We as manufacturers come up with the best products and and lead the charge essentially, right? Listen to the customer base and come up with new solutions. I think that's that's what we can do. All right, Sakit. Well, man, this is we've covered a lot of area, but this is a really good conversation. Um, I'm glad we had it. I'm glad you were able to take the time and talk to us. I know you're super busy, so this has been great. Um, what are you looking forward to over the next real short term here? Not not big grand scales and projects and stuff, but things on a calendar. What you, what you got coming up? Caleb uh, and Tasso, thank you for the opportunity. It was really uh, fun talking. Right, it's uh, the format was great, and it was just nice. It was just nice to chat about the industry and uh, all of that. Um, Obviously, the big thing now is Whisper America around the corner, right? March 15th ish in uh, New Orleans. Uh, super excited. We're going to be there. Uh, Cambium, I'm going to be there myself. Um, we're going to have a lot of cool things. And a few that are going to be the highlights is we're going to be talking and launching our uh, quality of experience solution, which you can come by the booth, learn and ask questions, learn all about it. Um, and equally important and exciting is uh, we'll have some demo uh, of our six gig product. Uh, you can actually come uh, check out the performance. We'll have an AP and a few SMs up in the air doing some high throughput, uh, the delusive 4096 Qualm, Caleb, uh, <laughs> granted inside the conference room. But uh, anyway, uh, Whisper America is going to be the place, right? So, you know, some cool stuff happening. And uh, please, if you're going, come on by. And if you are not going, hit me up. Uh, hit us up on the community post. You can send me an email at uh, sakid.ahmed at canyonnetworks.com at any time. Love hearing from the customer base and whoever's listening to this podcast. Again, thank you both for uh, the opportunity to present. Thank you. Thank you. Tassos, if anyone looking to reach out to find us, where can they find us? They can find us all over social media on our Facebook groups, uh, RFE English, uh, RFElements.com, obviously on Instagram, Twitter. I mean, basically, if you just put RF Elements in Google, you will find us. <laughs> we'll be at Wisp America too, uh, booth 509. Something like that. Yeah. We'll stick out. We got. We'll, we'll stick out. So, um, Cam, Camium's booth. Go check it out. It's always super awesome. Uh, I get, get envious of that booth every time I look at it until I see them setting it up, and I'm like, Nah, we're good. That's that's cool. So, <laughs> a little bit of an affair, but um, well, cool. All right, you guys. Well, until right, we cool. talk to you next time, y'all be good. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks. See ya. Bye-bye.